this world I have it I have it I have it this world I have it 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 I Thank you for joining us. I am your boy Rich, uh, representing Black Comic Lords and Black Superheroes Forever. And we are starting the Rich and Her show on tonight. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I, okay. I think we had a technical problem. It says unsupported jet request. No, you guys, no, you guys are fine. Keep going. Oh, okay, great. Go ahead. Sorry, Rich. Yeah, you just stopped my flow, bro. I know, man. I screwed up the flow. Anyway, we see. You see, we got it. We got a We got a a, a, a guest host. All right. The the the, the Don Dada Paul. He's with me tonight. We're going to be talking <laughs> with an, a distinguished gentleman. Uh, this gentleman really has his resume is extensive, and uh, I'm gonna be honest with you. It'll take a half an hour to just read all that this man has done. But it's suffice to say that this is an this young man is an executive producer. You have seen his work, well, whether it's the uh, Boondocks, Everybody Hates Chris, Marvel's Runaways. He's worked on American Gods. He worked on Hulu's Wu-Tang Clan, The American Saga. He's also a comic book writer. Uh, he's worked on Falcon. He's worked on Lando. And I wanna add one more thing to his resume. He is the writer of my favorite comic book, <laughs> Philadelphia. Without further ado, I want to introduce to you and present to some Mr. Rodney Barnes. Good afternoon, sir. How are Good you afternoon. today? Good afternoon. Thank you for uh, having me. Uh, doing okay. Doing okay. All right. Good to see you. We want to thank you for uh, spending a little time with us uh, as comic book fans. We really admire your work. And so to bring you here is a, is a treat for us. So I thank you for that. coming. And so, Very Paul, I'm going to go ahead and let you get started, sir, if you don't mind. Well, um, you know, get... Richard and I talked about this. We do these lives all the time. And I think the, the one question that com comes consistent in all these lives, and it's important for us as Black comic collectors, what's on your pull list? Oh, um, man, uh, didn't expect that question. Um, <laughs> A little bit of everything. I mean, I like excellence. I like bitter root. I like um, okay. I like the mainstream stuff. Like deceased, I think is fun. Yes. Uh, Mr. Miracle, um, American Vampire, um, some of the Black Label stuff. Um, I like mainstream stuff that tends to skew more independent. Like the boundaries are off. I've been reading yes. comics for so long that. To give me just a random Superman comic or Batman comic or whatever, unless it's something different, it makes it feel like I'm experiencing the same thing that I've experienced for the better part of my life. So, you know, I, it, it's funny. I went through a period for about seven years where I was buying comics, but I wasn't reading them. It's like a junkie. You know, I was stacking yeah. <laughs> up my heroin in, um, in the back room just in case I had a relapse. It was sort of... Um, just out of habit, every Wednesday I was buying comics. Right. And it wasn't until uh, I was writing them that I actually started to read again and see how things had changed. And, um, Thank you. Thank you. you know, the story had evolved a little bit more, sometimes not quite as much. But I found mostly indies are what I find the most enjoyable because the storytelling is unpredictable um, and the creative boundaries are more expansive. So mostly indies. Got you. I like. I, I got from well, all of the, the the titles that you kind of you a DC guy. So um, it, it, I grew up with DC because as a kid, you know, I'm dating myself, I'm aging myself. But Neil Adams and um, that was the first hook. Uh, Neil Adams art, Neil Adams covers, uh, Bernie Wrightson with Swamp Thing. Uh, okay. That that kind of stuff was the first stuff. And okay. But during that period of time, I was reading everything. Whatever was Frank Miller, Daredevil, everything. Okay, okay, cool. Now, we were looking at your background and saw that you went to Howard mm -hmm. University. Can, mm -hmm. can, you, can you explain to me, what is the deal <laughs> with that school? Because, like, 
you crank out so many blank black creatives. You Chadwick Bozeman, we had Ke- we interviewed Kevin Greavy uh, a few months ago. Like, what is with what is with? Ha- I got a cousin that went to Howard, mm-hmm. but it, it, even he's kind of creative. He does music and comedy and stuff like. That. What is with that school? <clears throat> I think it's the school, but I also think it's the area that the school is in. It's funny, I think. When you have focus, it's almost like going to NYU to become a filmmaker or USC. You're going there with intent. You know, you're going there with the intent of doing something, if you're in a creative world, to be creative regardless. So Anthony Anderson went there, uh, Marlon Wayans, a few other folks. uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, been there as well. And I think it's more of, um, when it comes to this business, there, there's a desire beyond just going to college that's already present. And I, Howard wasn't the first school that I went to. You know, at first I wanted to play ball. Unfortunately, I found out I wasn't good enough to play any kind of ball, football, basketball, <laughs> beyond what I had played uh, prior to. But the desire to be a creative uh, writer my entire life was already present. And I think when you're talking about being successful in life or reaching a particular goal, I don't think college can give you that. I think um, you can get an occupation, you know, that type of thing. But to be in this, you already have to come to the table with a certain psychological, emotional makeup. And schools like Howard, they sort of have a reputation for um, cranking out creatives. You go there with that in mind. So yes, part of it is the school, but I think part of it is the person that's going to the school that already has it within them to want to be in this business. Hmm. Well, let me let me let me take you in a in a weird direction here. Uh oh. One of the, the things Sunday, that we, you know the Lakers just lost, so don't go. Oh, too, oh too. man, I'm sorry about no. that, bro. And, and I know right. that, I know you wanted to watch the game because right now you're working on the the Lakers documentary. Is it for HBO? It's a scripted series. It's scripted um, series. yeah, it's a series series. So yeah. Lord willing, we'll be on for a hundred years. For, for is it and it's by HBO, right? Yeah, it's HBO. Yeah, so, so you know, watching the game is is almost like is almost like homework for you because it's it's kind of research for your your so series. Kind of, you know, the other night we were filming out in the desert when during the Golden State Laker game, and I was actually pulling for um, Golden State, and everybody was angry with me, and that part of me that I enjoy, <laughs> this adversarial, uh, enjoyed being the only person that was going against the thing that um, is paying my bills right now. So. Wow. Let me ask you, uh, as, as I mean, are you a ball fan? Are you a hardcore ball fan? Uh, let me say, when I was younger, Yes. At this point, I just enjoy seeing a good game. It's not so much um, with free agency. I grew up in Maryland and I was a diehard Dr. J 76 a fan. They could do no wrong. Yes, sir. And as I got older and free agency started, like you could be a Kevin Durant fan, but you don't know where he's going to be playing next year. Yeah. So if you're a fan of Oklahoma City, you don't mind if they, you know, folks come and go. But right. for me, it's the team. And I grew up in an era where stars typically stayed in their city and it was rare for, you know, the, the fixture player to move about. And now in free agency, the entire league could look different from year to year. So I just enjoy good games. Yeah, That's it. Got you. You know, it's interesting you brought up Dr. J because, um, you know, people people look at LeBron and, and KD as these guys who kind of went to teams or whatever. But I remember that team that won the title uh, with uh, Moses Malone. I'm 83, from Houston. Four five right. four. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Moses Malone was our was our center in Houston, mm-hmm. and man, I mean, I was hurt when they traded him. And and and, but he, you know, I mean, if I was happy to see him, you know, go to uh, Philly, Philly because he couldn't win in Houston. You know, what I'm saying it yeah. was just. It is what it is, but uh, you know, and that team, that particular team with with, with Doc, man, that was an incredible yeah. team. Yeah, that was a they, one um, two one two punch. And Moses Malone came right out of high school, I believe. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's a different day and time, but he was um, he was the truth. Absolutely. Well, Mr. Pa- Barnes, I want I wanted to ask you about your 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 road 
to you can actually call me Rodney too. When you I'll call say you Mr. Rod- Buns, uh, I feel like the government's <laughs> coming after me for something. For some money. I, I, so I did not want to Rod. be too familiar <laughs> with that. That's all right. Sir. I appreciate that. You can call me Rod. All right. Thank you, sir. So I wanted to talk about your road and how you got into comic book writing. Mm-hmm. And I know that you worked on the, you worked as a production assistant on the movie Blade with Wesley Snipes. I did. Um, did you get an impression or did, was there any semblance of, 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 of knowledge on the set that you knew this, how significant that film was going to be? Because, you know, one of the things that always pops up on the internet is how that was kind of the, if it wasn't for Blade, the MCU probably wouldn't have existed. If it wasn't such a mm-hmm. successful film. Mm-hmm. So was there any, you know, inklings that, that, that you guys knew that you were going to do something special that was going to be no. so significant? Okay. I think for me, well, I was living in my car at the time. So I was happy just to have a job. Uh, yeah. I'd driven out here, you know, the Hollywood story of living in your car until you, you know, you can afford better. So it was my first gig. So I was only thinking about, you know, being able to pay my, my bills and survive. Um, but as far as the, the blade of it all, for me, I knew it was different because it was treated more like science fiction and action, even though it had vampires in it. And you know the action being the martial arts part of it, and I knew it was different. I didn't have enough, um, you know, uh, perspective to be able to see what the influence would be and how it would affect, um, you know, box office and what the future was to be. I just thought, in comparison to a lot of the um, the other things that had been done, like I remember the Captain America TV show where he had a bike. The motorcycle yeah. from, from the seventies, <laughs> yes. Thor, that was the dude that just kind of had a shirt and you know a big belt and a hammer looked like a claw hammer. Uh, now, that's now, what I remember. Now you're, you're dating all of us because oh, yeah. all three oh, of us remember that. Oh yeah, and Hulk was the only one because Lou Ferrigno. Yeah. But um, you know, it, other than that, that's sort of what we had uh, in the Spider Man. He kind of threw a net at you. Yeah, um, it looked like silly string, you know. When he, uh, <laughs> and he hardly, he hardly ever walked up the walls or, or no, the, no, 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 no. And it was too much production. It, they would film it on the side, so he's actually crawling on his hands. But then they would tilt it back up and make it look like he was going up the wall. Um, you know, that's what I had known prior to. Right. So I knew this wasn't that. The effect of it, you know, I was just kind of proud that it was a brother in the lead yeah. and it was taken seriously. I knew that part. And Steve Norrington, who was the director, uh, he had done the effects for uh, Alien, I believe. He was part of John Dykstra's team who did the chestburster in Alien. And I was a fan already. So being able to um, see up close the effects and the practicals versus, um, I guess, what was CG um, for its day was just, it was an honor just to be in the midst of all of it. And Wesley Snipes did like most of his stunts, right? Like a lot of his stunts. He did. Uh, Wesley did a lot of his stunts. He did a lot of, um, he's very physical. More more so than, I forget the name of the brother. Man, I'm getting old. I forget the name of the brother who was the stunt man. He was a real cool brother. He did a lot of the motorcycle work and um, a lot of the real, the perilous type stuff. But, yeah. um, you know, it was just, I, I was proud to see someone one of us at the head of a production like that who you know really held it down and was truly a hero and um Sanaa Lathan was in it as well she right. played she played Blade's mother and um it was just a great experience all the way around yeah a lot of people don't realize that Sanaa Lathan was in that film oh I remember I remember, <laughs> I remember. did your did your experience working on Blade influence your take on 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 vampires for Philadelphia? No, um, my it, it's funny because um, I have loved vampires for the better part of my life. When I was a kid, kid uh, dating myself again, the company Aurora used to make these models that you could glue together, like Frankenstein, Wolfman, Dracula. I had all of those. I would read the magazines. I would watch the um, Saturday Night Creature Features and um, that had the mm-hmm. Universal Monsters and the old Bela Lugosi stuff. And I read the book, the original Dracula, Bram Stoker's, and then um, 
Salem's Lot and that stuff. And then Coal Shack, the Night Stalker came on. And um, that affected me. It was written by Richard Matheson. It was a movie of the week. But uh, Coal Shack, who was an uh, investigative reporter, was on the trail of a vampire. <clears throat> and that sort of just captured my imagination for some reason and never let go. And then my mother took me to a double feature of Blackula and Scream, Blackula, Scream at mm -hmm. our little movie theater in the area. Yes, and, sir. Uh, I had never place. seen us. And it was always in the back of my mind as a black kid, why I never saw us, you know, in the Hammer films or any of the stuff that I love. Yeah. And I got all the black people I could ask for in Blackula and Scream, Blackula, Scream. And it was one of those experiences where I, even as a kid, there were some problematic areas, like, you know, why does his lapels get bigger when he becomes a vampire? Why does his bell <laughs> when he becomes a vampire? I don't understand that part. I can go with uh, the sideburns getting bigger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything, he got black. Yeah, it was almost yeah, like yeah. not only was the vampire part, the feral part come out, but he actually became more black uh -huh. and along with being more of a vampire. And so I always said to myself, um, you know, if I ever get to a place where I can tell my version of a vampire story that has us, you know, the culture as the centerpiece, I would try to dignify us a little bit more in how the storytelling is told. And on both side, on both ends, I believe some of that comes across in Philadelphia. But another part is I've actually gotten the rights to Blackula and I'm doing- a, Really? Yeah, I'm doing a Blackula reboot Oh, 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 I was just about to ask you that. Yeah. What? Really? So that's Is that common step. knowledge? Oh, uh, my God. It's knowledge. I don't know how common. There hasn't been a big press release yet because we're working on the yeah. releases, but the paperwork is signed. I've paid for rights. I've done some things. And so um, I'm going to be doing Blackula. And Scott Hampton, oh, who did yes. the Batman Night Cries, the, uh, he's a painter, and he's painting the book. So um, we actually talked this morning and uh, I'm finishing the first script as we speak. Um, it's a tough one because um, there's the parts of it from the past that go with the black yeah. idea of then, but then it's now. And what I wanna do, what my goal is, is to bring the level of sophistication to Blackula that you have with Dracula. Um, yeah, right. And sort of, uh, take out those parts that sort of went with black exploitation, you know, because right, right. I think it's common knowledge that a lot of folks that did black exploitation didn't look like us. And the actors did the best they could with what they had. And yes. for me to have more of a creative say in how the story is told, it's an honor to be able to go back to, you know, that period. I mean, comic books for me are, there's a purity and the idealism that I had as a kid that you sort of lose when you get into the business because you realize how the business works. You know, right. when you write a script, the producers, there's a network, there's a studio, there's so many other hands that get in it that can influence how a story is told and what people finally get when they see a movie or a TV show or read a book. And for me, being able to do it um, in my way, same way with Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. um, under my banner, my company, my publishing house um, is an honor. So yeah, there dope. you go. Do you think that's why, like, we talk about this all the time. In fact, we just talked about this a few, a few days ago on, on a live about how, you know, right, I, you know, myself personally, I grew up as a Marvel guy. The ma mm -hmm. vast majority of my very, very extensive comic book collection is Marvel. Mm -hmm. Um. But right now, the Marvel comics are amongst the least ones I'm excited about reading right now. Mm -hmm. um, I'm having more enjoyment with all the Batman related books in DC and Justice League. And more particularly, I'm, I'm enjoying the indie books more than anything else. Like half of what on my pool list mm -hmm. are indie books. The other half is between Marvel and DC. And I think I just, I get this idea that they're, they're, there's just more freedom for writers to sort of do what they want to do without having to be contained in the sandbox of this pre-established 60 to 100 year war world, mm -hmm. you know, having inventing their own world and having the freedom to do and say whatever they want. 
I think it's very appealing. And as a result, we as fans, as, as readers, we get the benefit of new original stories that actually excite us. Yeah, I mean, for me, I go back and forth because I just did a, a cloak and dagger story um, for Planet of the Symbiotes uh, that came out a couple of months ago. Right. And I'm doing a Star Wars one shot coming up later this fall. Um, is it with Lando again? No, this one is with, um, uh, they probably wouldn't like me saying, but it's part of the War of the Bounty Hunters thing that's going Which on right one? now. I'm collecting, that's um, of the Marvel titles I get, Star Wars yeah, are one of the ones I yeah. get. Yeah, so they won't let me, they probably wouldn't like yeah. me. I, yeah. You know, I love y'all, but getting fired. You, yeah, know, you can't tell. No, 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 no. As, as, as an aside, <laughs> I don't know if you can see this, but the, uh, oh man, you can't see it because of the virtual background, but the Star yeah, Wars. I see Lando, Lando. I saw Lando, I saw Look, Lando. Let me tell you, bro. I'm a Star Wars fan. Mm -hmm. I mean, like since 77 Star Wars fan. And <clears throat> I loved when they, I, I'm one of the few people that did not hate the solo movie. Right. Mostly because of Lando Calrissian. Mm -hmm. And your take on him was like taking what you saw with Donald Glover's portrayal in the film times 10. Like the parts I loved about Donald Glover's take on that character, you maximize, you like said, you know, it was almost like you were in my head and said, you know what, what did Paul White Davis really like about Lando? Let me just build upon <laughs> that and do that times 10. And that's what you did. And oh, so you have this over the, over the top, swashbuckling, cocky, but can back it up with results type mm -hmm. guy yeah. times 10. Um, and I love that. I absolutely love this run. Well, and, and, and when it. they when they announced they're going to do a Lando series, I'm thinking, my God, I hope Rodney Barnes is attached to that because his take on that character as a television show would be so dope. So I, I wanted it. to know if, if if they contacted you about the show. It was funny. They after the book dropped, we had one conversation, and we haven't had one since. I don't think it's because of the book. I think it's because of. Um, the nature of how it, it, it's weird that um, every every four or five months, executives seemingly shift and move from place to place. So you can have a, yeah, we want to do this and this is exciting and you're our guy. And next week you see in the trays, that person was fired. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> they that conversation never existed. Or even if they were fired, they moved to another network or another thing or whatever. And this, you know, people are constantly moving. So, you know, the thing with Lando for me was uh, after Falcon was a struggle, it was the first book I'd ever done. And so I overwrote it, made a lot of mistakes. And that's typically when I see it, I, all I look at, I don't look at the virtues in it. I look at my shortcomings. And after that ended, I was so happy to just have fun with Lando that I sort of said, I'm gonna have fun. I deserve it. I, it comes I, across. Let me tell you, as a fan reading it, it comes across. It was just a fun read. Yeah, and that was what the goal was. The goal was, you know, I love Star Wars. I love the Star Wars universe. Um, I'm just gonna play with this and close my Twitter out for a couple of weeks and um, let the chips fall. I, I can't away. think of anyone <laughs> who was more qualified to be the screenwriter on that show than you. You've got the screenwriting credits. You got the comic credits. You've done the character. I I, I beg you, when you find the time, out uh, reach out funny. to to what's the name, <laughs> Kathleen Kennedy, yes. and Dave Filoni, and said, yes. "I'm your man. Let uh, me do uh, this character because I'm telling you, you writing that show with this voice would be uh, phenomenal." I hope my That's agents dope. are listening to this. So, <laughs> hey, my agents Let's, and my manager. Look, you need me to email I'm your agent? Out. I'll, I'll, I I'll reach out that. to them. I may need That's that funny. so that they reach out, but I don't know if, you know, the good folks at HBO would let me do that right now. See, mm. you know, they locked me up for a period yeah. of time and we got to get Magic Johnson going. Yeah. But, uh, but I would, I, I dig, especially if they do it the way they did Mandalorian, because I'm a Mandalorian right. fan. Right. Um, if they give it that type of budget and that type of expanse and scope, I think it could be a really dope show. Yes, yeah. I agree. Mr. Richard, Barr, I Mr. know you. I know you got a stack of Philadelphia well, questions. Well, man. I do, I do. But before we get, before I get, to, before we get to Philadelphia, Rodney, I want to ask you about Quinn Credible. Okay. Um, 
you know, it's, it's, a, it's, that's a is. The independent. Yes, sir. Yes. And uh, one of the things I noticed about it and when I first started looking at it, you know, you, you, you bring the story of Katrina, Hurricane Katrina into this. And I had never seen anything about Hurricane Katrina in another comic book. It's the first time I ever seen anything about Hurricane Katrina. It's almost like people have forgotten. You took a real life uh, event and, and you put it in this story and you married it with this, this accident or this, this, this thing happens to this kid. And so I, I just wanted to know um, when you began to write about that, I mean, did you have an idea that she was gonna do something with Katrina in mind? I knew that the story was set in New Orleans and I knew that they were going to have a, um, you know, the event that sort of uh, gives Quinn his powers was going to be at the central focus of it. And uh, the good folks at Lion Forge wanted to make sure the flavor of New Orleans was a part of the story. Yeah. And, you know, oftentimes when we tell stories about us uh, as a culture, we only talk about trauma from a very specific entry point. And for me, I wanted to speak to some of the realities of the place. Um, and I wanted to parallel um, that event that the, with the meteorites that affected Quinn um, to other things that had affected the community as well. And uh, Katrina being one of those things. And so to me, that uh, had a, had a how can I say, the social impact, the economic impact, you know, all of the things that had done to that area of, um, of New Orleans uh, greatly, I wanted that to greatly impact Quinn and his family so that the, when this other thing came, it's on the back of the thing that happened prior to. So um, that was where it came from. No one gotcha. gave me that mandate, but I like to, I liked to uh, blend, uh, especially if you're talking about regional, um, storytelling, uh, some aspect of the reality, like the second story, I think that comes out in July, the second um, mm -hmm. trade of Quinn deals with voodoo. And, you know, mm -hmm. voodoo being a part of New Orleans as well, and myth and lore. Right. And, um, so there you go. Okay. Well, let me ask you this also before we, we shift gears in terms of that. Have, have we seen the last of, of Quinn or are, we, are you going to continue to try to write oh. him? Here's, uh, I, can't, I guess they'd be mad if I showed you. That's the third book Okay. I'm writing right now. I'm in chapter three of the third book. Uh, the second book drops in July, and the third one, I think, comes out in the fall. And they're just doing them as trades now, not floppies. Right, so okay. You'll get the whole book in one shot. All right, now we can get to the good part. Yep. All right. Now, Philadelphia. Yes, sir. Is my go. favorite comic book. Mm -hmm. Um I was in love with Philadelphia from issue one. That's um, why I agreed to do this. Cause you know, I said, you know, some of your people, I don't see him anymore. I think he's <laughs> him. <laughs> heard him heard him beating up on my vampires. I said, Shit, you know, this is a Sunday. I could be watching a game right now. But then I said, No, everybody else is cool. Let me come on here and talk about yeah. this. Yeah. Um, I, I I gotta say, I look, look Rodney, I've been beating this drum when it come to him. I was like, man, you've got uh, to just read this. And and here's the thing. I think that the trouble is if he reads it, he gonna really like it. And 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 then it'll be one of those things where he, he won't probably stop talking about it. But uh, his, his, and, his nickname is the hater for the reason. And you know, some brothers, you know, you can't you can't get them to drink water and eat vegetables. You know, it's just some of us are hard headed and they just don't want, you know, quality in their lives. I don't yeah. know what it is. Yeah. Now, now he's got up the, the, the first uh, story arc, Sins of the Father. Yes. And, and what I wanted to ask you about, because, you know, for me, Philadelphia is about, apart from it being about vampires, it's about this, this father and son. Yes, this this yes. father who has a abiding wit about him, to where you know there's always tension uh, with him and and, and his uh, son, and so it that that's the like the main story, and of course the the, the vampires are kind of in the background of all of this, mm -hmm. and so I enjoy the first story arc mm -hmm. 
But I got to skip to the second one. Burn, baby, burn. Oh, my God. Yeah, man. That, that story arc is ridiculously sick. I, I had a chance to, to go back when we know we was going to do I wanted to reread it. And I went back and I reread it. And I got to say, it is funny. It is, it is serious. When I think about a character like Jupiter, now let me just ask you because Jupiter is 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 a guy who's who was a slave, who for the most part doesn't really have a whole lot of speaking parts, but his story is pretty um, numbing in the sense that he's a guy who has seen a lot of stuff, whatever. But he 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 wears this this thing around his neck or halo, if you want to call it yeah. that or whatever. Yeah. And, you know, for the most part, he just goes about his business. But when this thing, these instruments that are taken off him is removed, he becomes literally this monster. So I just was curious, where did the inspiration in terms of, of Jupiter, where did that come from? Annapolis High School. When I was in high school and I read about Thomas Jefferson, uh, there is a real Jupiter. He's based on a real person. Okay. Are you kidding me? Yeah, no, there's a real Jupiter. Uh, can look him up. I uh, forget his real name uh, because I've been calling him Jupiter for so long. But um, he actually loved Thomas Jefferson and gave him his money, his, the money he had saved, uh, I believe, for his freedom. He helped Thomas Jefferson when he had run out of money when he was in college, helped him get his books, uh, helped him get clothes and basically saw himself as Thomas's best friend and it wasn't returned, uh, that, that same um, uh, emotion wasn't mm -hmm. returned back in friendship. And uh, I thought about the nature of slavery. You know, we see so much certainly now when people talk about slavery and people, movies, TV shows, you see the physical trauma. You see people being beaten, and you know now they got special effects where you can get the whips POV and the skins POV, and you just can, you can get deep into the suffering of what slavery was from a physical standpoint. Um, I wanted to get into the emotional uh, stuff, the trauma that I think um, has affected the culture even to this day. Um, that idea that if one group, and by group, I'm not saying white people across the idea of a whole, but those who subscribe to this types of thinking, view black people as three fifths of a human being. It is difficult to have relationships that are, or less than, regardless even if it's three fifths. Yeah. It's difficult to have relationships that are friendships that are equal, that there's equality within the friendship. So whenever it's tested, there's a default someplace where um, you can turn your back or see this person that you've always viewed as lesser than, you can treat them in just that way. And what does that do to that individual that thought that they were your friend and loved you? Um, what does it do to them emotionally? What does it do to them psychologically? And to me, that was as heartbreaking and as traumatic as had he been physically assaulted in some way. Um, right. To me, just stripping hope away and stripping the ability to um, trust away to me was you, as you, tremendous. This, Philadelphia has been, from what I understand, it's it's, it's optioned, right? Yeah. Or, or I, I'm I'm trying to figure out how you're going to show the deep psychological ramifications or or, or, or viewpoints on slavery that you bring out in this book, because between Jupiter. And Toppy, mm -hmm. and now Sally Steve, Hemings, but yes, and Sally Hemings. I mean, seeing their perspectives on this, it's it's jarring. And the two girls, Brittany and Brianna, they're my daughters, right? Actually, in real right. life, I mean, they experienced uh, that as well. But yeah, that's going to be tough to see on screen. That's going to be not tough necessarily. I mean, I think you know, I've I've been watching them. Uh, on Amazon Prime. And I'm always, whenever anyone tackles that period, and I'm, I made it a point with Philadelphia to not necessarily just focus on that period of time, but because 
the founding fathers, you know, came from that period of time, you sort of have to look at it that being mm -hmm. an entry point of how a lot of this happened. But the Civil War, um, Reconstruction, you know, uh, I plan to go through different periods of World War II, Vietnam. Um, you know, if there's more to it than just slavery. But again, if you're able to, there's a simple math to it. If you can make someone, if you can create a dynamic where you have empathy for someone, mm -hmm. to me, you don't necessarily need the physical trauma in the same way in order to get someone to emotionally connect to them, if that's their thing. Um, so it's all in the writing. It's all in the character stuff. It's all in the ability to, the way I pitched this series to Jason Sean Alexander, who um, is uh, a co-creator artist with the book was. Incredible artist. It's, thank you. Uh, Sanford and Son meets Hamilton meets Dracula. <laughs> and so at each issue, I'm always trying to find, okay, the funny has to be here. The Hamilton has to be here and the Dracula has to be here. I think in the show, you have the same math that exists as well. And because, you know, the full idea of being a human being is having, being multifaceted, multidimensional right. in your thinking. And if the characters in this book are translated onto tele, the television screen in the same way, I think folks that dig the book will be happy. Has, has Philip Morris been contacted? Because that's clearly... Wow. Clearly, Jason. You'd have to talk to Jason. You'd have to talk to Jason, but I believe yes, Mr. Morris, um, who we communicate on Instagram, uh, you know. Does he know? Does he know that his likeness is 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 I believe he Hold is um uh Jason's uh model for him, I believe. I, I, believe. I don't would, hold me to that. I couldn't see how it couldn't be. <laughs> Even though in, in the first First book when he opens the coffin for the first time, he looks a lot like Tony Todd as well. Mm. So, oh yeah, Andy Man. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, now I want to ask you about another character. Then I want to get to some funny stuff. Okay, Abigail. Yes, yeah. Abigail is 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 a very complex woman who shares this history. And 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 she seems to be, the, I guess, quote unquote, the the villain or the so to speak, in this mm -hmm. situation. Mm -hmm. And it's, I thought it was the way this story arc ended, you know, it's kind of like, I, I can't wait for next week. I, I almost wish this this interview was a, a, a week later. I yeah. wish I could hold the book up for you and show it's right there. It's right there, it is. It's don't, right there. I feel don't cruel. Think, don't think I didn't peep that, yeah. that, that, that spin cruel. rack <laughs> fill the killer of that hasn't even come out uh, yet. It's right there. It's right uh, there. But, but it's not in she, my hand, so it don't matter. <laughs> she's a um, she's a very very interesting character. So I'm 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 just curious, where did you draw her from in terms of analogy? Um, because one thing about black and white relationships, we have these these complex relationships with one another, whether it's master slave, mm -hmm. uh, ally, you know that mm -hmm. kind of thing. They tend to change over time. Yeah, and, the with, power dynamics. Yeah, yeah, in particular, uh, what I've being all this all over the place, but Paul brought up Toppy, mm -hmm. who, who for the most part seems to be an honorable guy, mm -hmm. uh, and he finds himself, you know, in a situation where, you know, he. I guess my question is, what's his deal? Um, you know, uh, there was a Toppy story, a Toppy centric story where he was a funeral parlor. He's a funeral right. director. And, um, you know, I think what I try to do with each book is beyond the subject matter and that math that I just laid out, mm -hmm. I try to find a theme for the story, you know, to that kind of intersects all three stories or two stories or whatever issue. And for a Toppy story, it was anger. Right. and the corrosive nature of anger that all of these characters when i do one of those things where i'm talking about a specific vampire and their backstory you know where they come from um there's usually tragedy and trauma and then john adams is there to step in and take advantage of that opening and you know so he has another person to recruit um in a larger sense it's more of 
how corrosive the nature of anger is and mm -hmm. how um, it's very hard to see things as they are if anger is the thing that's standing between you and reality right. um, because it skews perspective. And Toppy is one of those guys that is using immortality to kind of vent the pain that he felt as a human being. And so, you know, Abigail is willing to take advantage of anyone exactly. and anything that she can use as a weapon. <laughs> it's like if, if Jupiter is mad, oh, come on, I got some place for you to let that out. If Toppy's mad, yeah. hey, we can we can get back at him. Yeah, that's right. They did you wrong. It's um you know, you will find that anger, frustration, um, you know, those things that we call racism, this gotcha. thing that we call racism, I think I like to look at the emotional fallout as much as the practical fallout and um, how that stays with us, how that trauma stays with gotcha. us over time. Okay. Now I got a question. Okay. Who, <laughs> who's, who's the Drake fan? Oh, you, you um, and Jason, you and Jason. <laughs> In the script, it said, um, you know, pick somebody that, you know, you think <laughs> would personify, you know, today's version of music. And, um, you know. Drake is, a, Drake is an actor. You could probably get him on the show. We will see. We will see. <laughs> we will see. It's expensive. It's expensive oh. that I'm booking people. I've come to find that out. But, uh yeah, man. Uh, yeah, again, yeah. shout out to Jason Sean Alexander, who's able to that, capture. Man, you know, I saw I just, when I first when I first laid my eyes on that that panel where he's biting. I was like, I just that's laughed. Drake. I said, that's Drake. That's not Blake. Yo, that's, check out that's Drake. Blake Scott. That's Blake Scott. That's, I don't know what you're talking about. Don't hurt about. nobody. Why y'all taking out Drake? Blake, that's Blake. That's not Drake. <laughs> Blake. <laughs> But I, I just, but see, that's the thing about artists. I love artists because artists can do things in their books that just can make you just chuckle. Mm -hmm. And that was a chuckle moment for me. And, and that was yeah, issue was. number eight. For those of you that may or may not know, there is there is a story, uh, a situation where, the, you know, the, the vampires go to a concert <laughs> and it just so happens to be a guy named Blake Scott. And I'm just telling yes. you, just go find issue number eight and just thumb through it. You'll get a good laugh like I did. I think I think issue eight might be my favorite of the series. Man, I tell you, let me see. I got I got a variant of issue number eight. Um the the cover, let me see if I can bring it out real quick. The cover is so I don't know if, if he if Herschel can bring that up. This one. This cover here, this 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 purple, this deep purple. It is yeah, Bill Sinkevitz. Yeah. Man, that is nice. That's, that's a dope yeah. cover. Shout out to my, the favorite, legendary. my favorite cover. Yeah. Yeah. Man. I had a question for you on, on John Adams. Yes. I thought it was interesting. First of all, just the whole premise that, that John Adams is, is in essence patient zero. Mm -hmm. You know, mm. and I and, and I'm a, I love history. And how you tie that into, you know, John Adams goes overseas and he comes back and you know he brings this over with him. Brilliant. Um, but the motivation for John Adams in forming this vampire league or what have you, this vampire coven in Philadelphia and their plans for the future and his desire to, to, to actually fix America, mm -hmm. you know, it, that was intriguing to me because it's almost like, and, and he mentions, like, you know, I never owned slaves, but I tolerated those that did back in the day, you know? And he's like, you know, this isn't what we intended for the country. And so I want to fix what we really intended. Mm -hmm. Because I, I'm, you know, by profession, I'm an attorney. So studying the Constitution and the law is something I've done. And, and one of the, the common themes that we always talk about is what do the founders intend in terms of the law or the Constitution? And, and what do we actually have? And, you, and as, as a black person who's studying this and, you, and, you, and you, you have to deal with the peculiar institution of slavery and the three fifths concept. And, you, and when you have those people that argue, well, you know, the founders didn't intend this for the country. And it's like, well, the founders were slave owners. The founders 
wrote that we were three fifths a person. The founders said that Native Americans weren't anybody. Who are the founders? Like, do, should we really care at this point? Mm. And I love the fact that you had a founder say, you know what? I was wrong. Um, I was wrong in my silence. I was wrong in, in my original thoughts. And I want to fix the country and make it right. I was like, I was starting to side with John Adams. I'm like, shoot, maybe he should wipe out Philadelphia. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> would that be a bad thing? I mean, he's kind of fixing. I mean, I appreciate the fact that he's owning up to the things he did wrong and he's trying to fix it. You got me siding with the bad guy. That's the goal. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, damn, if they took out John Adams. Like, I think that, then when they brought him back, when Tevin yeah. goes to the oh, after and brings him back, God. I'm like, yeah, John Adams is back. Hey, Abigail. Yeah. So, you know, just. We'll see how that reunion works. Yeah. Uh, in issue 13. But yeah. I, I was curious. I, I, just, just one last one last thing. I love the fact that the, 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 the undead are able to access the afterlife or, or purgatory. Mm -hmm. Is that all of them or just certain one of them? Certain ones. The way I look at the vampires in Philadelphia is you have three stages. You have. Those that are enlightened, those are the seesaws and the John Adamses and the folks that um, basically have the, the presence of mind and the ability to get past the feral nature of being a vampire to understand that there's more we can do with this. Yeah. Um, then there's like a middle ground of folks that can talk and move about, but they're minions, so to speak. And then there's the bottom level that are just mindless and hungry and, you know, just... Which Blood, one's James no. Sangster? Sangster, I would say, is begrudgingly between two and three in the sense that he did go to the afterlife, um, but I don't think he has evolved. He's so angry and he's so put upon that it's difficult for him to see his potential. And, um, yeah. you know, I, I think all of this went to the idea of being seen as a minority in the country and treated as a second class idea. I'm not even talking about as a person, just the idea of how our history is presented, how we're presented in history. Um, our needs, our wants, our feelings, all of that is presented in sort of a sidebar type of secondary uh, idea. Part of the goal of Philadelphia was to even the playing field with how where we're presented, you know, adjacent to these presidents and these founding fathers and the idea of humanity in both, that these were people doing this, that, you know, we elevated the idea. I could say I'm president, you know, unless someone treats me like a president, I'm just a dude. So being able to um, inject us into history uh, on an equal, you know, on an equal basis is sort of kind of the goal. But um, I think Sangster I look at as being the whole father son dynamic is really a playoff of my father, me and my son. Mm. And the struggles that we've had as black men to find health and function within our dynamic. And there's always love present, but sometimes we bring ourselves to the table and that's the flaw. The flaw is in us and it gets in the way of the love. And I'd never really seen in comics um, that type of subject matter, the vulnerability of being a black man, um, you know, uh, different, that role of being a parent in the real world, um, mm. having to overcome ourselves, <clears throat> having to be humble, you know, all right. of that. I just hadn't seen us presented in that way. So that's where that comes from. Um, let me ask you about Tevin. Yep. Uh, will we go a little deeper in terms of his story? Oh, yeah. In, oh, in the yeah. next arc? Because oh, yeah. <clears throat> I, I like what Tevin did <clears throat> when he went to go see, uh, I can't think of the, the, the creature in the underworld or whatever. Corson, the demon. Yes. The, the demon. You know, yes. he just kind of, I like the way Tevin just kind of walked in there. Just, <laughs> you know, he like he was running the joint. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm in hell. What you going to do to me? I'm already dead. It's like, you know. <laughs> That was some disturbing imagery too, man. Yeah. That's Jason. That's all on Jason's, Jason's portrayal Jason's of hell is man. disturbing. 
Whatever that brown liquor is, he drinks and takes oh, it wow. to another place. I can't really, you know. Now, now speaking of Jason Sean Alexander, mm -hmm. I'm definitely a fan of the art that he does, whatever. Most I know, definitely. you know, I wanted to ask, let me just ask you about Elysium Gardens first. Oh, okay. man, I got a yeah, whole the, lot of questions. The backstory, <laughs> because that is just as ill. Thank you. And, and when I was reading, when I first started reading it, I think it's issue number... Uh, Eight that that begins. Yeah. Yes. Then we get the issue. I'm like, I'm looking forward to it. Then at the back of the issue, the next issue, uh, we'll catch you guys at the next next issue. next time. Yes. Yeah. So that was so him. <laughs> that was him. That was Jason. It was Jason's fault. Jason said he didn't have time. Dude, I'm writing too I, many I was, pages. Was it was pissed. all on me. Yeah. I was pissed. I'm like, wait, where's the backup story? <laughs> me too. <laughs> me too. <laughs> He said, he, I mean, it was so funny. It, it, but, but here's the thing about it. What I loved about it. What I loved about it, it was a black thing. Mm -hmm. That he just kind of like, I can't, I hope, can't, Hershey, go to the end of that page, bro. I got it. I, it is so funny. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We'll, uh, we'll right catch there, right you on there. the next one. Go, go back. Go back. Yeah. Go back a few more. Yes. No, no, no. It's not that issue. It's the next issue. It's the no. next issue. But but they're talking about this in particular issue. Okay. Mm -hmm. Elysium Gardens. Um, an amazing story dealing with the 60s mm. and, 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 the, and particularly the Black Panther Party and I gotta say and I gotta ask is this, a, is this going to be an ongoing thing with Philadelphia mm -hmm. or will you eventually expand this and make this a book? Um, you know that's more of a, a time question because as I look to my whiteboard We've got four more books coming through Image towards the end of this year into 2022. So okay. it's really the bandwidth for how much you know we can get done. Um, I but, saw on your website that you had, you've got your own imprint. Yes. Z Zombie Love? Zombie Love Studios, yes, Zombie is, Love Studios. Is, are you gonna be doing Elysium Gardens on Zombie Love? No, Elysium, because it's connected to the Philadelphia world, will stay at Image in the Philadelphia book, okay. unless we start to do it off in its own thing. Um, it started with my desire to frame werewolves in a different place, and we're both big fans of Bernie Wrights and Jason and I, and he always wanted to do a black and white book anyway. So my proposal was, Let's do a mini story in the back of Philadelphia because back in the day when I was reading comics, I loved when it was more comic than just the A story, that there was right, something right. else that was there. So um, that's where that came from. Okay. But and there is a have, lot more story there. Yeah. And having Bill Sienkiewicz is inking over Jason's. Yeah, yeah that was they, they that's make a, a form It makes a pair. completely different thing. Yeah. In black yeah. and white. You know? Herschel, move, move, the, move the panel up. You was right, right, you was right there at it. What I was talking about. Herschel's still trying to hate on us. There it is. And now. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And let's yeah. still go out this world to resume yeah. next issue. Yeah. yeah that you. was Jason. He, that was all Jason. All of put, that was Jason. Then he put the management. <laughs> yes. That was Jason. That was I had nothing to do with that. I was as surprised as anybody else. Wasn't like I didn't write the script. You know, the script was written. Uh -huh. <laughs> but he's busy. He gets yeah. busy from time to time. Wow. Yeah. I, I got to say, I definitely enjoy uh, Elysium Gardens and I definitely, you know, looking forward to the next issues that, you know, that stuff is going to be in, man, because um, I'm like, man, and then it took so long for this issue to, to, to come out. I'm like, God, where is it? Yeah, and uh, I, I need, I'm looking forward to this crossover between the vampires and the werewolves. Like, that's yeah, happen. there's a good chance that that'll happen. Um, we still have to. It's funny because it's a mini. You really want to get folks who, you know, the regular readers to emotionally connect to who the werewolves are, and it's hard in five pages right. to get the same level of depth as you do with Philadelphia. But um, you know, I, I think in a few, in another arc, maybe. We may be getting close to something. I can't say what, but something good could happen. Gotcha. So um, you and Jason clearly have a good relationship in terms of, you know, you, as a team. As far as art right. is concerned, as far yeah, as comic course. books, I can't yeah. stand his ass. <laughs> I can't stand him day to day, but you're absolutely right. But, but you know, so I'm just, I'm just asking a question. I mean, will you guys work together on other projects that you have some things you, can you share with yeah, us? Yeah, I mean, he's doing, um, you know, if I had my way, 
every, damn near every book, certainly the horror books I would do with Jason. I mean, I think, um, you know, we started off as friends before we started working together and I knew his sensibilities. I was a fan of his work. Um, he didn't know what my work was because he was the one that was establishing this. I was just a writer of television and who wanted to do comics. And then I started doing comics and then we sort of <clears throat> looked for something together that we could do. So my hope is the Philadelphia spinoff that's coming later this fall, that's actually done. It should be running in previews soon. Um, that should, I guess, is that spinoff? What, what, yeah, what spinoff? Yeah. Um, What's, what exclusive are you about to drop on us? Uh oh, you got Blackula <laughs> already. You got Blackula. Uh huh. Um, that, hey, it's on hey. the website. So, okay. I, I guess I could reach back here. Yeah, you can reach back there. We, we'll be mad at you. <laughs> um, this guy here <laughs> what you got there this, this is a play cover but um nita hall's nightmare blog um that's okay. course in the demon again but it's basically um uh, the system when jimmy sankster left baltimore he had some history that he hadn't wrapped up yet mm. he just left to go bury his father there was a plan for him to come back and he was in a relationship and the woman he was in a relationship is a professor at Morgan State. And she's a professor of parapsychology. And she has the nightmare blog. And it's basically a paranormal blog where people write in, when they have paranormal problems, they come to her seeking a solution, seeking help, seeking something. Um, and she goes out to help them. And there's a demon basically demons infiltrating the city of Baltimore and they are making mischief in a variety of places. Yeah. And so um, it's set in the Philadelphia world and um, pretty proud of it, pretty proud. Got you. That, you that know, would explain why yeah. he was able to adjust to the concept of vampires fairly quickly. Something to do with it. I think um, he still is cynical. You know, he was a cynic in Baltimore. He's a cynic in Philadelphia, but I doubt that he's a cynic right now because he's going through his own uh, crisis right now, Jimmy is. You know, it's interesting that, you know, you, you, you bring up Baltimore. You, of course, you, you're dealing with Philly in Philadelphia. What is it about the, I would say, being someone from the South or whatever, I've only visited the East Coast like once. Mm -hmm. You know, and people talk about the South or whatever, when it comes to, you know, horror or the occult or whatever, they, they bring up New Orleans like you like you brought up. So I was just kind of curious, um, as far as someone from being from Maryland, um, what are the sensibilities in, in regards to the occult or what, because it seems to be alluring as well. Yeah, I mean, I think if you look back, my grandparents migrated from the South uh, to the north, you went basically to get away from racism and you went looking for work. And what was happening at different parts of the country, they sort of brought with them to wherever they settled finally. Right. And to me, I always thought that there was a, um, there was a lot of playing field that wasn't necessarily being utilized in the world of horror. And that we never really explored any other regional Stuff from once in a while, Candyman, I think, was in Caprini Green in Chicago. Chicago um, yeah. There was um, a few others. I think Tales from the Hood uh, was in L.A. But I felt like an ongoing thing that the mythology of which was generated from the city that you were in, that just I didn't see a whole lot of that. And, okay. you know, like I said, coming from the East Coast, um, East Coast is weird. Like my hometown of Annapolis, Maryland. Annapolis was a slave port. That's where Kunta Kinte landed uh, in the book Roots. And um, some of the math of that era still sort of exists, you know, um, in its own very unique way. And to me, if you talk about horror, the, the entry point for horror being trauma, primarily, right. there was no more traumatic period in the history of America than slavery. So you would think some of the echoes of that period of time would still exist in that area, certainly for that. And I'm just looking to exploit and tell some of those stories. You know, if ghosts were a manifestation of spirits that don't can't move on to the next phase, you would have ghost stories. If um, 
you know, voodoo priestesses and this, that, and all of these other things, they would find their ways to different parts of the country. And to me, it's not so much about race as much as it is culture. Um, I always say with the Lakers show that when we would have race conversations, you know, Magic Johnson is from Lansing, Michigan. Kareem is from Harlem. Spencer Haywood is from the Deep South. That's three different ways of being Black in America because you're coming from three different cultural entry points. In that same way, with hip hop, you got the same thing. You got your Southern hip hop, you got your East Coast, West Coast, all these other different regions, and they manifest themselves differently. I think the same thing goes with storytelling. Um, culture is how people do things and uh, the differences in there. And I think horror would kind of fall within that same place that you would have regional monsters and uh, you know the paranormal activity that manifests itself uniquely. That that's issue. why I kind of dig, that's kind of kind of what, what I like to dig um, Elysium Gardens and mm -hmm. the fact that you had these werewolves that have this connection to, you know, ancient times. And yeah, and who, and who were never slaves, you know, it's kind of like Wakanda slaves. in a way they don't know, like that, that anger is funny. When I work with actors, sometimes they come from different parts of the world. They don't have that American, the black ones, they don't have that American thing. There's a thing about coming in America that's different than in other parts of the world. And with Elysium Gardens, it was the same thing. I wanted to tell the story of black folks who didn't experience slavery and only know power. Right. So when they come here and they see what, you know, slavery has done to the minds of the people here, they're connected. They, you know, the purpose to come here originally was they were after the people who, the, the legacy of the folks who had turned them or cursed them. And then when right. they got here, it was like, okay, there's something bigger here than us that we have. Now we found purpose. Yeah, um, I love that panel where I think I posted it on our page. Where yes, you did. It says, we're going to take our power and we're going to we're going to right the wrongs with this power. I was like, yeah, that's that's so dope. <laughs> that's so dope. Like, yeah, I'm I'm like mad excited about Elysium Gardens. Like, mm -hmm. that, that's that yeah. you got a lot of a lot of stuff you can do with that. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no go ahead, bro. Go oh, ahead. Okay. Well, I wanted to kind of switch gears and 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 I want to talk about Boondocks. Uh oh. Oh. Because because Boondocks. Oh. Nothing classic, like a Sunday Boondocks con conversation. Classic, 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 classic. I mean, some of the stuff that they did, you guys did on on Boondocks, the the show. In a Boondocks fan from the I don't know. I don't know if you guys if, are you part of the reboot? Let me just ask that. I'm first. not part of the reboot. Okay. Well God bless the reboot though. I yeah. hope it's fantastic. Yeah. And but I mean, how do you do this though without John Witherspoon? I have no idea. I mean, I don't know um what the new thing is gonna be. I don't know how, but you know, I believe in that team and I believe that they'll be able to find something that is as compelling as what we did. Yeah. Uh, is is Aaron Magruder a part of it? Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Okay. I gotta I gotta ask you. I mean, what you you were part of the all of the all of the, the seasons up to this, right? Beginning to the, the beautiful beginning to the bitter end. Okay. Now the 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 the, the Christmas special or show mm -hmm. is probably my favorite. Okay. And because of wow. what you know the the, the 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 <laughs> the uh the story with with you know Huey writing this 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 play mm -hmm. and and then of course Riley you know giving Santa hail I just thought that that was funny man and I'm just curious as to when you guys were in creating this this art I mean were you guys having as much fun as it looked at times yes I mean I think um you know, the process of making television, regardless of what I've done, or regardless of what I've been a part of, it's never easy per se. You know, mm -hmm. the laughs are the laughs, but it's always a process. It's always gotcha. a process. I, I, you know, my my favorite episode, well, my favorite character first mm -hmm. is, a, <laughs> is a pimp named Sickback. Mm -hmm. You gotta say that the whole is name. my you dude. You gotta say the whole name. You gotta say the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. My name... My name is Paul Newmarks White Davis. Yeah. And I have people that are constantly trying to shorten my name. Can I just call you mm -hmm. Mr. Davis? No. Mm -hmm. It's Paul White Davis. You got to say the whole thing. 
That's right. That's a That's lot of exactly work. how I said. I said it's like a pit name slick back or a tribe yes. called Quest. You got to say the whole yep. thing. Yeah. Paul White Davis. My favorite episode of all time mm -hmm. is the fundraiser. Okay. I loved the fundraiser, and I loved it even more because I've got a I've got a nine year old little girl. When she had to do, when she had to do her <laughs> first fundraiser for the Girl Scouts, and I'm like. I now see it like this is my this is my experience with the fundraiser, and I'm like it. This really is. Uh, it, it really is a hustle. Mm -hmm. I'm like she brings home this brochure like, Daddy, if I sell two hundred of these boxes, I get this keychain. I'm like, is this real life? Yeah, I wasn't joking. <laughs> like, is there is there a way we can we can just cut out the middleman? And, yeah. and, and cut out the distro and go straight to the kids on the streets. Let's get some of the girls together. It, maybe we could sell this directly and just. I understood the fundraiser by being a father of a kid yes. with a fundraiser. It Favorite episode dope. of all time. I love the Boondocks. I met Aaron Magruder before the Boondocks aired. Mm -hmm. um, he came to my college to do a lecture. He was very he was very nice enough to uh, sign sign these two books for me. Mm -hmm. um, we actually got to talk about, uh, you know, Dennis Cowan and, and Miles, Miles Comics and, and stuff like that back in the day and hold up a big line of people trying to get a signature. But I, I'm a huge fan of the Boondocks and what you guys did on that show. It was, it was groundbreaking. It was phenomenal. Now, one of the things you said was I was there at the, be the very sweet beginning to the very bitter end. So mm -hmm. what, what, what happened? <laughs> um. You know, I know you're asked that question a lot. I am asked that question a lot, and I always try to, to couch it in a way that is respectful of all parties. There's a clear difference between season one and season four. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God, there's a clear difference. Um, it, 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 blah, 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 blah. It's not a whole lot that I can say, um, except it's kind of like a band. Um, there's a difference between the first, I'm going to date myself, first Shalimar album and the last Shalimar album. <laughs> um, you know, it's like, I love Shalimar, but uh -huh. there's something different, you know. And, and, yeah, and yeah. You take out enough of the ingredients, it's no longer Shalimar. And um, there you go. I, I yeah. mean, yeah. my advice is always to look to the first two and a half seasons, I think. You know, those are my favorites and yep. they resonate mostly with me and the idealism of making that show or being a part of that show. Um, and that's where my heart lay. Um, it is what it is. I mean, nothing lasts forever. And hopefully yeah. the new one will resurrect that, um, that feeling that, you know, those first two and a half uh, years uh, did for me. Gotcha. There, there, there was an era that ended that seemed, that seemed to end and coincide when Barack Obama got elected. Yeah. Well, yeah. There was like there's happy. something we, we were happy for a minute. Yeah, I know. No, I get that. I get that. Uh, we all were. But I'm like happiness on the show. Always, I'm always questionable. You know, I always question happiness, but get to when, when Huey said, Well, I'm retired. Yes. Like something just I don't know, I felt like broke in Huey after that. Like say, so I'm retired. You yes. know, it's like the show took a turn yes. shortly after that. I, I say let's all have faith that it will turn back. I hope he's, so. I hope he's so. not. We haven't had. We had the opposite of uh, Obama um, yeah. for eight years. I mean, well, four years. So yeah. there you it go. Felt like Thank eight. God it wasn't eight. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it, it felt, felt like eight. eight. You know, every Wednesday, there'd be slavery from like 12 to 6. You know, so let's be happy. Let's be happy. Um, the the Boondocks uh, episode uh with stink meaner, uh, the uh, when they when he was when he was possessing, I guess it was Tom, mm -hmm. and and it, it trans it actually transitions to who I, what I want to talk about next. Ghostface Killer is in the is in that is in that cartoon, mm -hmm. and so you got a chance to to work on the the woo. Yes, uh, season you one. still doing? Yeah, yeah. Are you part well, of? I'm season at two? the Lakers now. I'm not on season two because I'm at okay. the Lakers now. But yeah. Uh, so I wanted to ask you about about working uh, on that particular project. Um, uh, such a phenomenal uh, hip hop group. Uh, you know, I think that they're getting their flowers and rightfully so because of their 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 lyrical skill, their art. You know, I mean, they were one of the 
when when people talk about East Coast modern East Coast hip hop, I mean, you know, they're the guys I think about as far as a group. Because yeah. before that, to me, it was EPMD, and and really not much else as far as groups are concerned. Right. Um, they they were a, a significant group, and so I just was curious, how was it working on that project? It was beautiful, and um, RZA actually gave me a um, a nice blurb for uh, Philadelphia. Um, you know, the thing that especially shooting, we shot a lot of season one in uh, Staten Island, and Going to Staten Island, seeing what they grew up in, you know, I think the biggest kudos I can give to them beyond their talent is the ability to see past um, the boundaries sometimes that growing up in difficult circumstances can create. I mean, to have the wherewithal, not just to rhyme, but they had pop culture, the, you know, the Shaolin martial arts thing. They mm -hmm. infused a lot of evergreen subject matter into their music that makes it, you know, still fresh today. So um, it was an honor being able to work with them and to um, call many of them friends. Cool. Paul, what you got? I'm, I'm, look. <laughs> I was Paul's a Wu huge, guy, so he knows. <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of Wu-Tang, so I absolutely love that show. Um, I, I just don't have anything else to say about that. I mean, I just... When when the, when the season ended, I was just upset because I don't know when season two is going to happen. It's so. coming. They just, I think, uh, I don't know if they wrapped the season yet, but um, I'm still tight with them. So, well, let me talk. Let me talk to you about another show that you did. Uh oh. Uh, American Gods. Yes. You were executive producer of American Gods. Uh huh. And uh, you already know where I'm going with this. I'm trying to make you sure. I think. <laughs> I think that, I that, I look, that scene with Orlando Jones, mm -hmm. a Nazi in the slave ship, mm -hmm. how that did Iconic. not win an Emmy is beyond me. Iconic. Well, because they only give you Emmys for entire episodes, not for just one scene. But if, look, I, if I don't care what happened, look, I don't scene. care what happened in the rest of the episode. That, yes. That one scene was so, as yes. Richard just said, iconic, so pivotal, so. Jarring Anger gets shit core. done. Anger gets shit done. Um, yes. I mean, what was the experience of you, you guys being on set writing and producing that episode? Did you guys, did um, you guys, did it resonate with you the way it did for us as an audience to see it? Um, I mean, anything with, uh, you know, incredibly talented cast across the board. Orlando and I hit it off quickly. We had worked together briefly before on Everybody Hates Chris. Mm. Um, he had played a substitute teacher in an episode. And when I came in, uh, being the only brother there and sort of, I won't say responsible, but having a lot to do with um, the black gods, so to speak, Orlando and Sally Richardson Whitfield uh, were really bridges to my work on uh, season two of uh, American Gods. I mean, Orlando is brilliant. He's not just an actor, he's a writer. He's very passionate. Um, he's very connected to the culture um, and he knows his stuff. And so being able to uh, create with him um, in cold ass Toronto uh, was an <laughs> honor, um, you know, for the five, six months that we worked together. Um, you know, one of the high points, one of the high points. One of my favorite scenes with him, apart from the slave ship or whatever, was when they were, they was at the- uh, Funeral home. The funeral home. Snatch. And yes, 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 that's the one. Yeah. And 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 I and I said to myself, I was like, man, I wonder how many black people are watching this. Probably not too many, only yeah. because of what it is, you know, where it's stationed, where yeah. it's positioned, how it's marketed. You know, right. Like, because what he says in those few minutes or whatever is amazing and it goes on every day. Yeah. And that's why when he got fired, I know I was a little, I was upset. Yeah, I, stopped I mean, watch, I honestly stopped watching the show after he got fired. Yeah, I mean, you know, and a lot of that was Orlando. I mean, it didn't come from the writer's room, it came from Orlando. Um, you know, we worked together on that and put that stuff together, but he already had it in his heart that that's what he wanted to do. And if you know Orlando, Orlando, mm -hmm. he does not take no, or, you know, no does not mean no. And 
you know, a lot of that passion is, yeah, it was that character, but it's also that guy. So, um, you know, awesome. honor to work with him, honor to work with the God, uh, the God of Nazi, the, the spider God, the storytelling trickster. Yeah. Um, and, you know, who knows? Maybe one day that character could show up in Philadelphia. Who's to say? Ooh. Oh, we can only we can only hope. Yeah, oh no. Public domain, you know. You never yeah. know. Nazi on killer. Damn, now you just shook me to. You, the you core. never know. I you know didn't what? say that was what was going to happen. I said <laughs> you might. never know. You never know. <laughs> or even Elysium Fields when you talk you about know, how you... far back they go. Yeah. Oh, having a Nazi. Wouldn't it be something? Wouldn't it be yeah. something if that happened? Man. Oh, okay. Rodney, well, you, well, you, look, you, look, you're just look, jacking look, us up right look, now. Look, look, look. We, we, that's a high note. That with, with that being said, Mr. Barnes, we want to thank you. We want to wrap this up. We want to thank you for being with us. And I haven't, have even any... the, I haven't even asked him the Falcon questions yet. Okay, well, go uh -oh. ahead and ask. We got to wrap this Quick. up, but go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, Paul. Quick, go ahead, five nice minutes, time. five minutes all right, of Falcon. Right, That's all he deserves anyway. Five minutes of Falcon. <laughs> Here's the, fir the first. The first is the easy like one. five minutes of funk in honor of Houdini. But go ahead. <laughs> did, did, that, did anyone contact you about? Your take on Falcon for the Falcon and Wilson, Falcon and and and, and Bucky show? Uh, no, uh, you may not really. I mean, they gave me a gift. They gave me a big gift um, that's here. It's got some stuff sitting on top of it. Um, no, they didn't. Um, but I thought Malcolm Spellman did a really good job um, uh, putting it all together. Um, but no. What what prompted you to create a new patriot? In, they create um, Nick Spencer created that patriot. I was just mandated to use him in the book. Okay, um, so they mandated that you use him in the Falcon book. Yeah, I actually did a patriot story in um, what was the name of that? Uh, it was called Birth of a Patriot in uh, the event book that they were doing at the time, and uh, that was the first short story I did for Marvel. Then they gave me the Falcon run. So um, I actually didn't know that. Yeah, there's a short story with a uh, Patriot in there and um, Birth of a Patriot. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's in the thing where Cap uh, goes bad for a minute. What was the name yeah. of it? Um, That's the Secret Empire. Yeah, this, it was that, but it was, um, they did a, like, just like what I did with Cloak and Dagger, they had these little offshoot stories um, mm -hmm. that were collected, and I wrote one of those. But, um, that's where Patriot came from for me. And I just integrated them into this story. All right. So your take of having, first of all, I love the Falcon series and I think it's really kind of slept on. Mm -hmm. um, I'm hoping that it'll get a lot more shine now that people are, you know, sort of coming off of the whole Falcon and the Wearable Soldier thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I loved, you did several things in this. I know you said, you know, in retrospect, it was, it was your first sort of writing gig and there are things that you wish you could have done better or changed. I, I liked it. Thank you. Um, I liked it for several reasons. The, the apprenticeship of, of Falcon and, and, and Patriot, I thought that was cool. Uh, it, was, it was a modern take on the sidekick deal. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that, that Herschel and I used to always battle about is whether or not Falcon was a sidekick. And I think I, and I, that's who I grew up with him as. It's like yeah. I always knew him. He was on the other side of Cap at the top of the banner and he had Red Wing on his shoulder and he just caught, sort of flew in whenever Cap was taking an ass whooping to punch one right. guy. And then Cap kind of whooped the rest of the ass. That, that's what I told him. I, 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 you can't tell Herschel anything, but. <laughs> I, I told her it was very problematic. I can't tell nobody who to be friends with. You know, I would never do that. But I'm just saying, some friends don't have my best interests at heart. Oh, Watch her. Too funny. He Watch was. Funny. He was clearly. He was clearly a sidekick. No, uh, he wasn't. See what I'm saying? And he listened to us the whole time. Listened to us the whole but time. But he grew. Have a conversation. He grew, and and, and yes, I like sir. how you addressed it yeah. in, in the story. Um where Sam is reflecting on his life. And he's like, you know, I decided to take this role of, of Captain America. The name got tarnished with what happened with Steve. So I'm going back to what I really am, which is Falcon. And the fact that he takes Patriot under his wing and, and he refers to him as a sidekick. I'm sorry, he refers to him as a partner, not a sidekick. Um, much the same way Cap did with Falcon. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was cool. 
because he wasn't raising a sidekick. He was raising his own full-blown superhero. Mm -hmm. And I appreciated that. And mm -hmm. then... Although Falcon in the prior run, when he was all, you know, Captain America established this relationship with Misty Knight, you fleshed that out further and said, you know, we kind of had this thing before you, when you were Captain America, but we never, it was kind of like just, we, it wasn't really defined. What are we? And you ultimately addressed that in the run. And one of the things that, I, that always bothers me about Marvel comics is you don't really have too many established instances of black relationships yeah the well, they don't i love the most is, huh well they don't last very long they don't last very long they the greatest one they could possibly put together it's child and storm they took away from us over some mm -hmm. foolishness <laughs> um and you established this other one which is a really good one two great storied characters and uh, i appreciated that Thank um, you. but then you slipped in this is why this is a great run then you slip in this whole vampire storyline Mixed in I, with... I was going to get my vampires out one way or the other. You were going to get your vampires one way or the other. You bring my, my boy Blade in. Blade's yeah. looking at Misty Knight like, so, Sam Wilson, is that like, you know, a thing yeah. or, you know? I, I got some pushback from that because Blade is supposedly asexual, I guess. And, is, is that what it is? Because like, I'm like... I don't know. I first, don't know. All I can tell you is you're the first time I've ever seen Blade ever push up on somebody. That's what I'm thinking. If Blade is cool, look, if you're wearing a leather jacket and you're wearing shades at night and you're doing yes. all of that, who are you doing this for? You ain't got to be you. Vampire Hunter. Vampire Hunter is a job. You don't have to Blade, Blade you know, is like over the sexy male man. What's the point of being a sexy male Blade man? is like 80 years old. You're going to tell Blade, Blade doesn't like to get his sexy on? Come on. Come on, man. If Dracula, if my thing was, this is my argument. If Bella Lugosi, Frank Langella, Christopher Lee, all of those guys tried to play at different times a sexy Dracula. You know, yep. cool. Why can't the dude that's hunting a vampire who's half vampire? Why can't he be sexy too? Yes, thank you, buddy. yes, sir. You thank know, you for bringing. Thank you for bringing Blade sexy. All of that style <laughs> and nothing sexy. Come on, man. Why are you going through all oh. of it? It's boot them boots and all of that. Got to be uncomfortable. Who wears leather? You know, in all of that heat of L.A. That's funny. Just wear a t-shirt and have a sword, and you could be cool. <laughs> That's yeah. what's up. And with that, we're going to go ahead and, and begin that. to shut this down. But I have one last question for you, Mr. Barnes. Um, cool. Who would you like to write? Swamp what, Thing. What comic book? Swamp Thing, really? Oh, yeah. I would love to write a Swamp Thing book. I would love to write a Swamp Thing book. I, okay, have, we... I have loved Swamp Thing from the DC, early DC run, the Alan Moore run. Um, yeah. A lot of how I write Philadelphia and all of my stuff is inspired by the Swamp Thing, Alan Moore's early writing and uh, Frank Miller's early writing. I'm not saying I'm anywhere near any of those two gentlemen, yeah. um, but I like the prosier, poetic type of, you know, and yeah. uh, being able to to speak to something. I love words. I love the way words feel. I love the rhythm of words. And gotcha. some folks today just want to tell a story. So they just say, this happened, that happened, this happened, that happened. And everybody has their taste. I still like, you know, poetry. I swore your answer was going to be either Blade or Dr. Voodoo. Nah, <laughs> they were in there. I did that. You know, yeah, I, I like, did that. I, I would love to, to be able, I would love to be able to do a Blade mini. I would love to be able to do something with Dr. Voodoo. Um, but in the pantheon of other Marvel, you know, monsters. And I love that world. I love the monster right. world that they had. Right. I would love to be able to do that. But Swamp Thing sort of is the antithesis of monster plus thinking and emotion yeah. and spirituality and all of that. And that's yes. what I think. That's there ain't going to be a lot of that in the Marvel universe. So. No, 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 no. Well, thank they, you very they... much for being on our page, Rodney. <laughs> We You're welcome, man. You. you know, because it's Sunday and I'm trying to get my life together, I'm going to even say goodbye to Herschel. Because um, <laughs> I'm hey, trying man, to get better with all of this. <laughs> the day he is, he just popped up. You know, I'm going to even say goodbye to him. You know, because I'm trying to live better. I promised the Lord that's what I was going to do from this point. Hey, hey, and I'm going to start off with, you know, with Herschel. Herschel's going to get himself together. I don't know what it is. You know, Pray for but it's gonna get better. I, I, that's when I say my grace. When I eat this meal, I'm gonna say, you know what, Lord, <laughs> pour out a little liquor for Herschel because he's struggling oh. right now. 
He's struggling right now. Uh, but Herschel's, Herschel's me and Rich's project. Yeah. yeah. Bless y'all. Bless y'all. There's, some other, <laughs> there's a lot of kids in the community. A lot of kids could use y'all's help. I'm just saying. Herschel's, Herschel's my ticket to heaven someday. Oh, uh, please. You and your family. Your whole family's going. Everybody y'all know is going to heaven or working with Herschel. Oh, my God. Yes, sir. We certainly thank you, Mr. Barnes, for being you're welcome, with us. Brother. I'm just before we let you go, just you want to give out your social media, or let us know what you're working uh, on. At the Rodney Barnes, uh, Instagram and Twitter, uh, working on the Laker show, mm-hmm. uh, things that make white people uncomfortable at HBO Max, uh, mm-hmm. Tiger Woods miniseries, um, Iceberg Slim. Uh, what? Uh, what? Hold up! Whoa, 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 whoa! whoa, whoa, whoa. Stop, you can't stop, just stop, name stop. drop uh, Iceberg Slim. Iceberg Slim. Iceberg Slim. Ice, you um, didn't say nothing about no iceberg slim. Y'all didn't ask me. Um, <laughs> what else? Um, what else I got up there? I can't talk about that one. Can't talk about that one. Um, there you go. And a bunch of stuff. About 12 okay. different comments. Just, just, just and real quick. What, what's, what's with the iceberg slim? What are you doing with iceberg Many slim? Many series. Uh, already written the script. Um, trying to get final approval, but uh, Tiger Woods is done. Iceberg Slim is done. Boy, a bunch of different things are done. So we'll hey, see what happens, man. Yeah. For, 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 all, for all the young people out there, I want you just to Google Robert Beck. Yeah, you Iceberg go. Iceberg Slim. There you oh, go. You get, a, there you you get go. an education. But again, yes, you will. Barnes, you got me shook. thank you. You've been generous with your time. You've given yes, us some nuggets. And uh, from Black Comic Lords and Black Superheroes Forever, we want to just graciously our doors are open to you whenever you got something that you want to share, whatever. Please, please, please plug what feel free to, to drop please. any upcoming comic projects you have on our page. I definitely will. Black is coming. Uh, I've got a ghost story. Crownsville is coming. Um, got a, bu- a book with the exhibit. Um, Florence and Normandy, a sci-fi alien attack thing. We're your audience. Coming. We're your supporters. We're your fans. We'll be the first ones in the stores to buy you stuff, man. Yes, Thank sir. you, brothers. Even you, Herschel. I will talk to you all <laughs> soon. <laughs> all right, y'all. So, uh, Take this, it easy, brother. This is, thank you. Right. God bless you, sir. Back bless. at you. Take all it right. easy. Bless up. Bless up. Hey, okay. fellas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you all bless. tonight for listening to us. Bomb.com. Bomb.com. You can't even tell us nothing. <laughs> We Yo, when Richard hits his field. chest like that, he's all <laughs> in. Man. Okay, you don't really do that as much. He's oh, all man. in. But well, you know what, guys? I gotta say, um, you know, we we have, we do this for fun, and we have a good time with it. And uh, you know, we we put this work in, man, for moments like that. Yeah, you know what I'm saying we had black. We had the creators of Black Cotton on Friday night, and Mr. Barnes just graced us for an hour, almost two hours. <laughs> Uh, hour and a half and uh man i gotta say you know somebody upstairs like us so you know let's just keep doing what we're doing man, you guys have any thoughts before we shut this down or what i'll say this um rodney's finna get so heavy that they gonna say hey uh excuse me mr Barnes, there's there's some guys raving about black comic lords they say they know you you're gonna be like yeah yeah tell them i call them back i'm busy including uh you go you go home blow I mean, he's, he's it's gonna get it's gonna get so big, man. I'm just glad, and that's one of my things. Like, that's why I created this space mm-hmm. is because a lot of the people that are black creatives, some of them have went on and passed on, or you can't even find them. And it's like, wow, they, they you know, it's it's like a stone on, it's like leaving a stone on, on unturned. And I'm just glad that the space was created for us to do this, and we're not afraid to approach people. And they, everybody has said yes. So that's always good, especially when you hear back, man. So I appreciate you guys. It was an amazing interview. I'll be here for the next five, six hours trying to put it together and, and upload it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, man. What, what about you, Paul? What you think, man? What you what you think? Those was Rodney Barnes, man. I mean, you when I, when you go through the resume of, of what he's done comics wise, I didn't have to like rush out to the stores. And 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 go buy it to prepare for the interview. I just had to go into my boxes. Yes, I mean, sir. I, I've been reading this brother's stuff for a while. Like I was, yeah, <sighs> Rodney yeah. Barnes. <laughs> I mean, yeah, definitely, definitely. I'm a fan. Yes, sir, definitely. I'm a fan as well too. 
also everybody that's 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 with us right now i don't know how many people we got checking in with us or people that are gonna see this video if you look at paul's block bend down paul go down paul so they can see see what what you oh. what you are looking at that's sitting behind Pick paul right now is the official black comic lords logo we haven't given them name yet but we're gonna come up with something but that's our official logo for this uh, particular for space. For this space. For this space. We, Black we gotta, Superheroes we gotta Forever. Black, Black Superheroes Forever will have its own logo, but this is the official logo. You're going to see us at some point rocking this on whether it's a t-shirt or a hat. You're going to, this is, this is the brand. This is the logo that we, this is the brand. This is the movement. And uh, we want to thank every one of you guys for supporting us. We want to thank you for tuning in to these lives or whatever. We trying to take this thing to the next level. So we want to ask, we solicit your support. We solicit your prayers. We solicit your, your ideas. We, if you want to, if you want to be a part, we solicit you in terms of you, if you got a skill, you can write, yeah. you, you know what I'm saying? You got a passion or whatever, you know, you're a creator, you know, hit, hit us in the DMS or whatever. We also, you can hit us on, the, on our uh, email blackcomiclords at gmail.com and uh you know we'll chop it up and 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 go from there but yes we created this space this space was created for people like you and i who are melanated who want to see their faces in the eyes of superheroes characters and all of that good stuff so we make it moves y'all uh we're gonna continue to do what we do and we're gonna try to continue to be a blessing uh i gotta say you know to my boy herschel want to shout him out want to be want to just say publicly that we are proud of you you have kept your nose to the grindstone you've been putting out these dope videos we know that it has not always been easy me and paul have Jesus. pushed you and push we're going to continue to push we 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 know that like paul told rodney barnes you a project and we keep pushing so we're getting good stuff out of it paul so i think it's, it's going to be all right <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and shout, shout out to Sabian T. Willis. He's the artist who, who's done this image that you see behind me. You guys will see him again. Very talented artist. He's got a comic book that's, that he's working on that he's going to be coming out with. You'll hear more about it in the future. We're going to support him and, and, and put his Patreon up on our page. Sabian T. Willis is a name that you're going to hear in the future. Yeah, this will also yes. work for us, man. Good turnaround time for this logo, man. We've been trying to work on a logo forever, man. And, and when his stuff comes out, it's going to be a smash. I'll just make sure y'all go out and support it. Um, but yeah, and, and, and I got some surprises too. Not even the, the whole BCL team knows, but I dropped some, some, some stuff today on the page. And I think it's going to have to marinate a little bit in some of you guys' minds. But um, yeah, I, I got, I'm going I'm to I'm a unveil some stuff. So, and I'll just say golden age. That's all I'm going to say it's golden age, but I got some surprise, bro. But anyways, yeah, man, yeah. we got to get out of here for real. Yes, sir. Richard, yes, sir. Uh, Paul, we coming back on to? No, we probably ain't. Cause my no, wife, man, we 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 we, we 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 gonna. I'm gonna go eat me some barbecue and celebrate. That's what I'm gonna do. Yeah, I'm gonna think about. I'm gonna think about this this Blackula, uh, <laughs> whoa, this Blackula movie that's gonna come back out. Man, I wanted to ask that question, and he just dropped it. I Drop, mean, bro. Kept it moving. Black it's Comic out. Lords. We got two Black Comic Lords exclusives. The the Blackula Drop Iceberg Slim. I'm good. Yeah. And the other, don't forget about Nita, the other comic book that he's dropping too. He's busy, man. Yeah. He's busy. That guy's there's like we talk about James Brown. Yeah, Rodney Barnes. We got to we got to add his name to the list. Yes, Artist sir. Working man in show business for sure. He's uh, not lazy. I'll tell you that. Let me call you back. <laughs> 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 Yeah, y'all. So, you know, again, fellas, you know, great job, great energy. We we certainly appreciate each and every one of you. Um, you know, this will be up on the YouTube page pretty soon, you know. So with that, guys, normally we wouldn't come on to like seven, eight and eight, nine o'clock, but we got an early thing. So you guys can get up, you can go watch some TV, you can go kind of hang out with the wifey if you want, you know. We gotta worry about her yeah, shit. Like you gotta worry about her shit yawning on the screen. <laughs> but I will say this though, before we go, Philadelphia uh, issue twelve, is it issue twelve or thirteen? It's thirteen, I believe. Thirteen is 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 out on Wednesday, 
So that that we got a lot of books coming out on, on Wednesday. Good. Herschel's gonna post up my picks for this upcoming week. We got a lot of good books coming out. Yeah, a lot so of good. We, we tired of y'all talking about me. Hey, where that book come out? Huh? I didn't see that in the pre. So every what? week we're gonna be key collector app to it. Okay, those some of y'all look at key collector, they books a week. <laughs> we're gonna pull the black important books on this black covers, black Paul's picks of the week. I am uh, tired of posting up these black comic <laughs> pre-orders to have y'all fools talk about what when book should I out. buy this week. <laughs> and I posted the book up two months ago and like, oh, I didn't know about this book. Mm. This book just came out. Mm. I posted it up two months oh. ago, dog. Two months oh. ago. Hey. So y'all can get the pre-orders. Was... You can get it at the lowest prices. Paul, Paul. there was a I'm guy. I'm not angry. If... I'm just upset. There was a guy, Black Superheroes Forever. I think Persia put up a Philadelphia book. He was like, why the F, what the F is this? And why I ain't up on it? I'm like, man, Killer Death been out for over a year. I, I even did. I <laughs> it, it is literally impossible for you to be on this page for 10 minutes and not know about Philadelphia. But yeah, we, 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 got a, we got a lot of challenges ahead of us, guys. But there's a lot of good content coming out. You know, we got, we got John, a, a John Stewart run. We have, um, you know, uh, Infinite, uh, what is it? Infinite Frontier. You, you're going to have a uh, a Valzad story coming in the in the comic books. Not to even mention the I Am Batman that's coming as well. There's a lot of black books coming out now. You can fuss and you can fuss about you know what we you want original or content or whatever. Guess what? There are independent black creators in this space. They selling comic books. You need to link with them. Don't be looking to us always to find out to, to tell you what to go get. Part of the, what we do and the pleasure that we have is to, is to hunt. You need to go hunt these books as well. Yeah, we man, can't do all the work too. We need you to go out hunting, bring those books, show those books to us or whatever. We'll talk about them. These creators, if they're in here, they want to have a conversation. We ain't hiding. We right don't, here. We'll talk don't, to you. Don't, don't but, tell me you don't have nothing to read when you got books like Philadelphia, Bitterroot, Green Lantern. I you mean, might you get got blocked. all these books out and you yeah, say you, you got nothing to read. That's just impossible. Yeah. You might get blocked. Yeah. I'll just let you stay ignorant. Anyways, guys, we got to get out of here. <laughs> as y'all just added another hour. That's going to take the dollar an oh. hour and 30 oh. minutes worth of Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, with that being out. said, peace. Love you. We see you when we see you. Black Comic Lords. Peace. Right. <laughs> <laughs> just for this thing.